48, supposed to start at 45. Welcome to the 18th of July, 2017, Collins Amateur Radio Club meeting. Uh, we'll go around in an introduction so that if you hear folks on the repeater and you say, who in the world is that? This is where they fess up. So I'm KC0CD, Charlie. I'm Tom, KD0HF. Gary, K0GT. Barry, the zero IY. Then send to AIE. Uh, Bill and zero and Tim, KC zero D M. Dave, W A nine H B C. Larry, AB zero Q X. Al, K A zero I E S. Joe, W B zero Y F L. Larry, K zero M T M. Steve, N A zero I A. Mike, I don't have a. We can fix that. <laughs> and Mike and Evie and are working in the same area, and they've been interested in this and what's going on. So I said, "Hey, tonight is your night. Show up." Good. Evie, I know that Marconi's transmission was at seven megahertz. <laughs> well, there you go. Yes. Mike, DC zero PV. Christopher Caldwell, DC zero YGI. All right. So, <clears throat> Dan couldn't be here tonight, but he did tell me how much was in the bank. 8,000 and 9,000 for a total of 18,2, which that's probably the most we've had in there in some time. So, uh, we're, we're gonna take care of that real shortly as we go down the slides here. You'll see it, it's disappearing fast. The sucking sound is <laughs> pulling the doors off the bank. Um, <clears throat> so, Tim's going to give us a talk tonight. That's the ossifers. Uh, let's see, there's, uh, uh, yeah, well, we got a majority here today. Okay, uh, when we were up at Dayton, I, Tim and I went to the talk where, they, where they're, what they're trying to do is um, get as many people, preferably running um, digital modes. Uh, uh, PSK31, CW, and RIDI, and they're going to use the um, PSK reporter. And what they want to do is determine how quickly the D layers and E layers and all that other stuff changes when it goes into the hole under the sun. And they say it'll change pretty fast, they think. But because it's going right across the middle of the U.S. and a little bit south, we'll be at about 90%. So basically, they say, take the day off and transmit as much as you can. They're gonna, they made a QSO party out of it, so there's points and all the rest of that stuff if you're into that. Or you can just, I would imagine, just turning your radio on a certain band while you're off at work and just so it's receiving and reporting what you're hearing would also be a help. But if you can have, be there and have it transmitting and making contacts and everything, uh, they're going to gather up all that information from the whisper and the PSK reporter to uh, determine, you know, where you are and where, how the uh, disappearance of the sun affects it. Kind of like what Tim's going to talk about tonight. And you can go to hamsci.org to get more information. So that'll be fun. And they're going to be doing some APRS stuff with it. So lots of folks, they're, they're trying to get lots of folks involved. Let me see, did I turn this on? I didn't turn that back on. There we go. Are you hearing me over there? Oh, okay. Okay, this has been purchased. The ultimate, and he's not even here tonight. He was supposed to be here. Yeah. The Ultimaker, this is the 3D printer. I ordered this and... Uh, the several reels of um, filament. filament. There you go. Yes. And a couple different heads so you can have different sizes on it. So that should arrive within the week. And Greg, being the sacrificing guy he is, has volunteered to take it home and make sure everything works. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know. We may have to lay a force over there to get the sucker back. But it'll go up in uh, 112, so anybody can, you know, anybody that's got the uh, retired, on the retired list can go up there, or if you're a member, you can go up there and print some 3D stuff. So Greg's 
set up with the PC with the software on it so it's good to go? Yeah, and we'll set that up. Uh, probably a dedicated PC. They're not trying to squeeze what they already have. Although the one that's hooked up to the Flex is a an i5 game machine, it's pretty hot. So we could use that one. Uh, he and I, I haven't ordered a computer specifically for it, but um, you can do this stuff on your home machine and bring in a stick. It doesn't take so, a lot to run it. It doesn't take a lot of horsepower. Yeah. Right. And the other thing is, how's our internet connection on 112? Uh, it's so about... Maybe we can set it up so you can remote into the PC and just push the files and run the, run the app uh, over a remote desktop. Possibly. I don't know that actually. Mm -hmm. The, the you do want to be the parts, parts. We really kind of want to What's that? watch the thing because Don't you want to be there to catch the parts. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's one of the problems. It, there, yeah, we don't we don't want to, anybody to be shooting water down the top like they did back in '98 or whenever it was. The, the thing that takes a lot of horsepower in the computer is if you make a 3D model of something, then you got to slice it. There's a there's a tool, software tool called Slicer, and it looks at, oh, the filament's this thick, and the thing you want is this tall, so mm -hmm. in the first pass, it's this. In the second pass, in the third pass. It's like an MRI. Yeah, so you got to, it is, you gotta, you got to slice it, and then that file, you can go put on a memory stick. Oh, and, oh, right. And, and, and uh, manufacture it. But the CAD work that you do ahead of time is more Intense. processor horsepower than actually right. the thing's pretty slow. So I brought that server that's at the main plant yes. that nobody likes because it's got it sounds like an APU. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got enough juice to cut whatever. <laughs> yes. Well like I said, this other computer, unless you're running flex at the same time, it's got more horsepower than and everything and I think, you know, whatever control line goes over from the computer to the plotter probably isn't all that tough. What is it? A, USB. Yeah. Yeah, that would be. So anyway, that's the plan with that. Um, gentlemen. Um, so we had talked about getting a laser cutter, a laser and also a pick and place. At this point, we'll probably do the pick and place next. The question with the laser cutter is while you're cutting laser things, it's going to be outgassing. And we've discussed around about that, and you know, are we going to just kind of vent that into the air? Well, I'm going to take off and just let it fill the room with gases and soak downstairs. And that. So we're debating on how to do that. Maybe somebody will volunteer their place off campus where we can vent it outside um, that folks can get to. Oh, you I'll going? Volunteer. Oh, okay. Yeah, Greg's volunteering to take care of the 3D printer at home. And oh, so okay. <laughs> but we may do that. So problem is, you may be awake at 11 o'clock at night. Somebody out there. Well, the pick and place thing doesn't have all the gas. No, no. I'm I'm talking about the laser cutter. Yeah, the pick and place, I think we're going to go ahead with that. We've got a few identified, and so that's the plan with that. So that's coming along. Um, IC7000 has been used by several folks. In fact, it made a trip to the South Pacific and worked okay. Uh, the KX3 is always being checked out by somebody, and then it was used um, on field day with the 100 watt amp. Buddy poles out there. I do have a D80, whatever, uh, the 80 and the 92 D-Star handhelds, if you want to try D-Star. You can just check them out and borrow them for however long you want. Okay, um, he's not here tonight, but of course, you know, it's a uh, f f uh, 10 to 15 watt receiver, um, or transceiver. Uh, Dave Kripe thought, now this would be a real nice one to add to the, uh, <laughs> what can be checked out. They're about five, uh, $500, quite a bit less than the uh, KX3, but similar in operation. I read through some of the comments and they said, you know, it's 
it's a nice $500 radio. Runs on 12 volts, 15 uh, watts, phone, 10 watts side uh, CW. So think on that. Maybe we'll add that. Is that something Dave designed? No, no, Dave didn't do this one. This is designed somewhere over there, and and it comes. No, it's all put together. So it's an all put together thing, and I mean, 500 bucks. Yeah. But you want to make a move to buy it? <laughs> that SDR well, stuff is such a moving target. Yeah. That's true. How, how different is this than that U kit one? I don't know. There's quite a bit more bands. There's one of them that's got a, a color LCD display. And yeah, well, you can do that with a bit of expanded. It's all like an notch, but. Yeah, this yeah, it's pretty much all banned. Yeah. 160 through 10. For $500. For 500 bucks. Put it in your pocket. See, that's the reason for the voltmeter there. Maybe they have a really big voltmeter. Sean, is your plan for this to make it into another go kit? Yeah. Make, make it available to anybody that wants to check it out. What's that? I say make it available to anybody that wants to check it out. I did not determine that. I couldn't tell. You know, everything I read on it, it didn't say. And it may just be that you have to, that this is the power supply. Mm -hmm. External 12 volt battery. So anyway, that's something to think about. Okay, what's happening over there, the whisper station is, uh, it was well within the uh, specs when the guys were up on the roof measuring the strength of the signal. It's three watts on that antenna. I think it showed up on his. So um, it's doing well. Come up and use the station. If you're not checked out anything, let me know. I'll get you checked out. Mike got checked out on a bunch of the equipment today <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> now, one thing Tim's going to talk about is diversity. You know, we're big into diversity around here. Well, the, uh, the K3 in the 112 station is a two receiver um, machine. And the second antenna had never been hooked up. So I drug a cable over to the back of that. So all you need to do is take this cable that you see hanging down here and hook to whichever antenna you have right here, a broadband vertical and the beam to uh, make that a dual diversity reception. So you could have a vertical on one and a beam on the other to see what diversity would do for you. Now, we have the same thing down at main plant on the Orion. It has a two receiver, so you can do diversity on it. And I, there's another extra jumper to hook the second receiver to whichever of those other antennas. So you disconnect the antenna switch and hook it up. So if you want to try that, I'd be happy to walk you through doing it. I've had it hooked up, so it's it's cool. Oh, we got somebody else coming in. Oh yeah. Oh hi. Thank you. I didn't know Okay. So that's the second receiver. Um, what needs to be done? There's a 160 watt two meter amp up there. The the uh, again the K3 is wired for two meters whatever mode, sideband, FM, CW, <clears throat> it just puts out 10 watts. So we have 160 watt amp, just need somebody, to, and, and there's power supplies there that'll handle that. Uh, so we need to do some cleanup for the uh, printer and the pick and place, and then the ongoing thing about a remote HF. Uh, we're, we're talking about several different options on that. And then, oh, I found that there was an LED light for the rotor up there and it was just laying there so I installed it. <laughs> really nice. Thanks Barry. And connected the second K3, updated the K-Line software and updated the F Win 10 and FL Digi and WSJTX and the Flex 6500. So if you want to be president you can do that kind of thing. 
Oh, and we, people are talking about the D-star problem. This was late last fall. And it turns out that when, they, when, I don't know, Ron went out there and actually looked at it, it kind of found that there was a, uh, <laughs> somebody ate right through the coax. <laughs> That's the center conductor, though. Okay. So, uh, Mike can tell us what's... What? Yes. So it didn't make a good link back to the station. So, Mike. Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, so, our satellite. Well, I'm. Our satellite station. Everything we got rotors up. We've got beams up. They all work. We have a computer there that's been installed. We have a radio. Just need someone to throw it all together. So, whoever wants to start doing some satellite count. We've got all the hardware in place. I don't know what software's on the computer. Probably nothing yet. Thank you very much. And what, what am I doing here? This one? Okay. Okay. So. Okay. Well, I'll call him. With his knowledge, he popped that together. Right. So we got the computer. We got. We've got every everything there. Um, this is an older one, isn't it? Yeah, it is an older. I didn't get you. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't oh. get one from you. I said it. Well, in oh, my well. okay. Anyway. Oh. oh yeah. But once we get once we start digging into it, it'll be obvious what, what it's needed, and we'll fall to here. Yeah. So other than the saddle, uh, there's some uh, general cleanup that we need to do. This is a little bit older of information here. Um, the one thing, oh, I do want to mention here, uh, we, we've, we're having our annual antenna surveys uh, on the roofs at Rockwell Collins. And so for the amateur radio clubs, we had our Building 112 survey today. I was there with Charlie on the line, so he to help me out with that. Thank you, Charlie. And tomorrow's going to be main plant. Um, but one of the things, the guy, the contractor who was doing the our field strength measurements, had asked, he says, I'm not trying to cause any problems. I'm not trying to enforce this. I'm just here to make the measurements. But just to let you know, there are new or newer OSHA regulations that were helped pushed through by Polyphaser Incorporated that requires all feed lines coming into buildings having, per OSHA regulations, now having some sort of ESD slash lightning protection. Oh. <laughs> That's like Ford Motor Company. <laughs> Yeah. Is it official, official? I, I, or is it proposed? That's what I'm going to look into next. It's just, I just want to put that out there. It wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't, I don't know one, to, I know that at main plant, we've got polyphasers on all of our entries on that building. I don't know, I haven't looked closely at 112 yet. I just want to throw that out there and I'm going to look into it some more to see if, what these regulations are. Are they in place? Are they proposed rulings? Or if they're really, really going, I don't know. Yeah, when the government starts dictating it. What's that? Just bulkhead grounds, or do you have to actually put active protection on the line? Active protection, yes. Then that's why I asked him about it. I said, well, I know that we've got all of our returns bonded to, but they're, they're talking about center conductor coming in. Like, I mentioned, you mean like, like a polyphaser device? I said, well, yeah, actually, and they were the ones that helped, the, uh, helped OSHA you know, push through the regulations. It's, it's like Humana saying, hey, we need this thing called affordable care act where everyone's required to buy insurance. Yeah, what a great deal. Um, so anyways, uh, I need to look into that yet. I don't know. He just happened to mention it. It's, it's worth looking into. I don't know what the status of that is. But uh, 112 was fine. There was nothing super hot there. Uh, if, if things hold like they did last year at main plant, our vertical is going to be very hot, which I'm surprised because if you do the math on it, at 40 meters, you almost have to be licking it at 1,000 watts to be above the, what the OSHA has, what? There's two levels there's, uh, of emission levels. There's one that's for a higher level for if people, if the only people in the area are aware that there's emitters in the area, know to stay away. And the other one is John Q. Public. And we're trying to keep the roof, they're trying to keep the roof at Rockwell Collins down, all the measures down below the John Q. Public levels. So when facilities go up, they don't have to worry about it. And they made a measurement to get down below the OSHA allowable levels 
for our vertical that's in the middle of the roof, they had to go to the edge of the butler buildings, they were saying. So I don't know if we just have a, if we're lighting up that roof, if I, I don't. We have, we have ground wires running out there. Yeah. We have ground. We have ground. We have the ground of that of the uh, feed po of the antenna to that big bulkhead right. yes. assembly, which is tied into the girders through painted metal. Right? You know, maybe it, 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 it may not be making a good uh, electrical yeah. contact yeah. to the me metal structure. Well, That's my guess. On it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The visor has always been fine, so I don't. But anyways, uh, that that. Survey is tomorrow at Main Plant, and I'll be helping run that one. So. so one thing that would be nice is if we had somebody that was in the area of 112, that if something came up, I mean, Brian McCoy's name's on the door. <laughs> Who's <laughs> now retired. Ten years. He's no longer in the company. He's going to be in Des Moines. That would be kind of a long to come back. Could put my name on. I can come in. But it would be nice if we had somebody in the building. What Charlie's saying in a nice sort of way is we really need a new station manager for the Building 112 station. That was Brian McCoy in the past, but he's now retired, and like you said, Charlie says he's moving two hours away, so. so. So for all of you who have been chomping at the bit, now's your opportunity. You get to be the czar of Building 112. The closest person to the building, if anybody wants to try to convince him to do it, the closest person to the ham shack over there that works in that building is Danny Rhodes. Oh. Well, Dave Cripe's off in that area also. No, but Danny's even closer. Oh! Jeff is not close anymore. He's the one over Yeah. So, anyways, I'll mention it to Danny. So. Anyway, that's... That's what we got going on. And then the restoration project, project which we're still slow rolling. And I know that uh, we could always use some more help there. And Jules has been scratching his head on the auto-tuner trying to get that back together. So, if there's anybody who's looking can for... Can talk about that too a little bit? You sure can. Uh, Jules came, I have two things that I'd like to discuss. One is I did a contest in, uh, at W0CXX, the VHF six meter, two meter contest. But, and I also, you know, I sent out an invite. Guess who showed up? Jules. Um, <laughs> Jules. So he sat with me for a couple hours while I was contesting, uh, which was interesting and, and stuff like that. But he really has a passion for this project. And he really, I don't think they're really looking for somebody that really knows uh, complete hardware design of this thing. What they're looking for is they have a lot of mechanical stuff that they need to do. Uh, Wires need to be pulled. Well, it's more even gears and and things like that. So they need they need somebody that he says oh, it'd be just nice to have somebody that has some mechanical knowledge. And so, you know, they're not looking, you know, he said that that's what he was looking for. And so, I mean, and he, I mean, who better could you spend time with Jim Jones and Jules? Okay. <laughs> what two better people, if you have time to do that, boy, I, th I have, if I had time, I would be over there. I just don't have the time. But I mean, Jules is a great guy. Jim Jones is a nice guy. Uh, it'd be kind of fun. It's like maybe a click and clack event over there. I don't know, but it would be kind of neat. So I'm trying to say, hey, it doesn't have to even be somebody that is in our club. It just has to be somebody that wants to be committed to helping them. Okay, so this is your opportunity, not just to find some, not just for you to do it, but also find somebody to help them. So if anybody wants to do it, let's make this happen. Yeah. Well, they can they can get you a pass. They can get you a pass. So, anyways, I'm just putting out a passionate plea for Jules. I mean, he has a heart for this. I know. I mean, he talked about it. We talked quite a bit about it during the whole time. Uh, so, anyways, that's what I heard him say. So, the, can I talk about the other subject? Okay, the other subject was, hey, I contested at W0CXX. And uh, Bill and Rod were out in uh, Mobile Land. Uh, Wyatt was out there in Mobile Land. Um, let's just put it this way. Wyatt can reach people better than I could from W0CXX. With a 70-foot tower. With a 70-foot tower. 
So what are we missing? I'm thinking the 9100 ICOM radio with that little dinky power supply that powers everything over there ain't enough. So I suggest we buy the biggest Astron. Oh, I've got a 550 a amp. <laughs> I mean, power supply on the other station. I'll take over there. I think we need to have that put over there and the cord shortened or make sure we're getting full power to the ICOM radio. The other thing is we truly need to do some antenna testing because I'm yakking away on two meter calling CQ to Minneapolis with, since I didn't get full power out of it, I added some more power to it. I brought in my big amp and uh, two meter amp, and I gave it the full power, like 200, 200 watts, 200, 300 watts. So I was giving it, and I brought in my own power supply. And so, but anyways, they could hear me in Minneapolis fine, but I can't hear anything from anybody else. So there is so much noise or something. We need to do some analysis on, I mean, I'm trying to say is that if you're going to try to contact satellites on that station, I'm not thinking you're going to have very much luck because there was so much noise during the day. Different I know different antennas, different location, but I was struggling on two meters and 432. No, I did not use the satellite. I used the tower antennas with the uh, preamps. I tried it with and without the preamps, and I wasn't, I'm gonna be honest with you, I was not a happy contester. <laughs> Maybe we need another 50 feet on the camera. <laughs> I don't know, I don't think we need another 50 feet. I think there's something, <clears throat> noise or, I mean, hash or something. I, I mean, we really need to do some like, like yeah. Yeah, and stuff like that. And and I'm not. I remember I am not the best uh, com guy. I'm kind of a software guy, so I don't know why it wasn't working. I was just the operator. The operator error. <laughs> <laughs> But believe me, I thought, I did think the 9100 was set incorrectly, so I called Wyatt and I asked him, repeat what I should have it set for and how it should be set up. And the guy has, if you have not met or remember or met Wyatt, he has a photographic memory. He told me what buttons to push, what to look at. And I did that. Yeah, slow down. And uh, I set it up the way that he wanted me to set it up, and I still had problems. So, anyways, Wyatt I just what? Wyatt has the knack. Yeah, he yeah. has the knack. Yes, definitely. But anyways, I just want to tell you the only other thing that I thought was interesting that since I've contested at both shacks, um, one twelve is actually a little bit ergonomically better. Uh, and the reason I'm going to tell you is that if you're going to contest at W zero CXX. We need to have the ability to move the uh, rotor control to whatever position that we're at. And so it's just, it's just really kind of hard to, and the other thing is, can we speed up rotor control? Can we move that beam faster? Because no. I mean, it is like, I mean, I seem to be slower than everybody else. Yeah. And uh, on, the v, on this contest, you're constantly, yeah, waving it back and forth. Waving it every which way to, to Dixie. And uh, I just seem to, you know. You put fiberglass in the bolt pants, which Anyways, I just thought I'd tell you that, that I had a great time contesting. I've contested at both shacks now. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, it's, oh, it's wonderful to have such a myriad of equipment. But if I would let, if I had some druthers, more power on two meters, more power on six. So rotor control, why aren't we remoting those? What, they are. You can yeah. run it off the computer if you want. I didn't know that. I didn't know how to do that. But I you can bring up H Ham Radio Deluxe and it'll couple right into it. Is this not rotor now? Yeah, spin it. Yeah, so anyways. Pick a spot. But anyways, 
Great time. All right. Head by all. And if you help out Jules and Jim Jones, where else do you need to work on a radio? Where your main supply is at five kilovolts. Right. Where the low voltage supply is 208. Okay. And where is this? Building 120. Two buildings that way. Okay, so for talk today. Um, Tim's been looking at uh, several different items, and uh, diversity being just one of them. This is for the, and this is for the room PA. Screw this thing here. This one goes on this side into this pocket. Like so? Yeah. Need a few more radios to hang on. That's right. Okay, are we here? Oh, yes, okay. <clears throat> All right, so I've been doing two things the last couple of years, one of which is working on nuclear scintillation. The Air Force came to us and said, we would like to talk through a nuclear blast. Can anybody do it? And all the other companies came back and said, no, we, we can't do it. We don't know how to do it. The big explosion back in uh, 1962, Starfish Prime, documented the fact that you can't do it. So <clears throat> it took me three years, but I got the Starfish Prime document. And I'm going to walk you through what is unclassified in that and what I came up with through that. Um, and then I'll go into spatial diversity and uh, show you some things that you can benefit from using antennas that are spatially separated. All right? So is this? OK, Starfish Prime, July 9th. What they had on, um, they had a boat called the Acania. And it was down south on the magnetic antipode, if you would. Um, where the nuclear, the nuclear event, the, the, um, the nuclear event is, is uh, a local event, but it has a mirror image following the magnetic field into the magnetic conjugate area. The Kenya was sitting there underneath that area. And indeed, it was, it was zapped just like the area underneath the nuke was. So uh, on Johnston Island, they had these frequencies, so they had a pretty good sampling of what was happening at HF. And the thing you have to remember, and this is what everybody missed, is that the antenna was a 150-foot pole, a vertical gaggy pointing straight up, straight up. And it was a radar set, an HF radar, on those, on those frequencies. So they were doing in this, OK? Now, here are some of the statements from the redacted document. And you can see, you can find this online. The Chinese have this, unfortunately, as do the Russians. <laughs> But you can see the first thing is we conclude that a new F layer formed presumably as a result of the ionization from the debris clay. So, bluey, a new F layer formed, all right? Now, they admit that the original F layer was, was swept away by the physical, the blast itself, the particulates itself. So, the F layer that was there poof, disappeared. So, what they have is they have, they have a radar going, transmitting pulses, an HF radar going up, and so they're mapping with you know, INVIS, what's happening, the bomb goes off, they have about a minute and a half's data before the bomb goes off, and then they have six hours of data afterwards. So anyway, also, F region lowered critical frequencies. When you get away from the blast area, lower frequencies began to work better. I mean, they, they dropped down, all right? And then the lowest four frequencies were coherent. They were they were the same. They weren't disturbed or scintillated or messed up. Um, and these, um, they were not. They were, they were, these were still screwed up. 20, 30, 50 meg were screwed up. So it's data that they published out there. Now, I, I keyed off this first thing. This was four years ago. And I thought, well, if they appear, then perhaps we can exploit them. And I'm working with Dr. Jim West down in Dallas. And he both, he both and I, from separate documents, came up with the idea that if HF operated up through 50 megahertz, during a nuclear event, you could probably communicate by getting above 30 meg. Because when you get above 50 meg, it didn't bother it. It didn't bother it. So here's what the radar looked like. 200 microsecond pulses. That's the pulse repetition frequency. So they had 10,000 watts going up, OK? 10,000 watts. So they could propagate that high, 1,200 miles, 
Um, yeah, just a huge, big, honking ham radio station putting out the letter E. <laughs> so um, directly overhead. Now, this is an unclassified thing. I, I, I presented, this is taken from several presentations, and I, I gave this to a, a one star down at uh, Stratcom, I, I mean at Global Strike in um, Shreveport, Louisiana, whatever our base is down there, Barksdale. And they got all excited that you can't say this, you can't say this. Well, you can, it's from Australia. They, they just, a big solar flare hit the earth. A big solar flare smashed into the earth, caused a whole bunch of disturbances, a lot of auroral activity, and somebody had the foresight to plot what HF was doing. And they found that the absorption going up and down at five megahertz really took it in the shorts. But a higher frequency didn't. And when you get up to 20 meg, it was hardly affected. So there's a message here. So here I'm briefing this big crew of, of uh, military guys, and they're sitting there saying, can he say that? <laughs> but this is off the internet. Anyway, so connectivity still exists, but it moves spectrum, OK? Maybe even up into low band VHF, and it's sporadic. It changes. It, it's moving. It's, it's mo changing. So if you're communicating here and you lose it, your normal thing is I'm going to look around in that band. I'm working 80 meters. Well, when a nuke goes off, you're not going to be working 80 meters, talking to the same person that you have been. But if you move up in frequency, you will be surprised. OK, now, this is where they got it wrong. They looked at this INVIS data. And what the data was was a, a, move, a moving camera, not a moving camera, a fixed camera with geared film. So the film slid past a one inch diameter oscilloscope tube that was drawing the blip as it went up and down. So it got these vertical lines. And the, the intensity of the blip was, was, a, was the receiver output. So if you got nothing back, if your blip went up, you got nothing. It was just all white. It was just exposed film. Not, nothing happened. Reverse, reverse negative. It was a positive image. So if you, if you did get a blip back, you got a black dot, right? Now, if you got, so you get a black dot at a certain time, it would be a dot, and then it would go up. And if it hit nothing else, you, you just have a one black dot. The film's moving, and they're doing this at, uh, 100, at 150 times a second. So what you got were this stream of dots. So if you look at 40 meters before the nuke went off, what you saw was speckling stuff all around and a thin gray line going through it. Interesting. That's just normal. That's normal 40 meters, this, this, this gray line that you see going through there. Because I went back with vocap and I plotted what the ionosphere was doing on that day with that sunspot cycle at the hour at 9 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock in Hawaii time, um, when that sucker went off. And it's great 40 meters. It was, it was doing well. The sunspot number back then was 12, just like it has been this week. So meaning it was crummy. But you could see it. Um, now, what the experts got wrong was when you look at the data, it says it clearly doesn't work. It goes away. That's true. But it's not gone. It's somewhere else. That's what they got wrong. And they also missed, I need a graphic for this. Um, remember, their, their, their instrumentation was pointing straight up into the debris cloud. Now, that's true. Now, there's three classified numbers. I can't tell you what they are, but I can tell you what, what, what kind they are. The diameter of the cloud, how fast it gets that big, and the altitude of where it was in the ionosphere. It's public knowledge that they torched it off at 250 miles. 17 miles northwest of Johnston Island, basically straight up. So you're saying the bomb went off at what altitude? 250 miles. 250 miles. Mm -hmm. And the F flare is at 90? Well, the F is higher than that. I mean, what is the F at? F? Yeah. Uh, 600 kilometers. And so at the delivery, it's F. Well, 400 nautical miles, 400 miles up. And they, they, they torched it off in the middle of the ionosphere. That was deliberate. They had not done that before. They've done low ones. They did higher ones. This was specifically for the ionosphere. They launched it. It went up 650 miles, curved over. And when it came down, it blew up right there, right exactly at the altitude they wanted to see what happened. Um, now, here's the important thing, is that when, when it, during, this, during this time, there's three phases 
in the um, three different way the ionosphere reacts. The first way is an absorptive period, and everything I say is, is public. You can get it. Um, Invis is dead straight up. It truly absorbs the signal. Nothing comes back for a classified amount of time. All right? Now, remember, this absorptive period, the debris cloud is relatively small, and it's moving out at a classified rate. But remember, over here where the ionosphere is, it's not there yet. And there's places where it never gets to it. Right? It gets so thin it doesn't do anything. So when it spreads out, you know, when it spreads out, there's going to be, from, from a, a bomber standpoint, all of this low angle, non invis connectivity is completely unchanged. So think about this. If this bomber is listening to somebody talking to him from 2,000 miles away and the nuke goes off right over his head, he won't feel any change. His comm will not be affected because he's doing low angle communication. He has all this angle to do it. Now, the place where you would be bothered is if I was over here and I was doing, I was refracting through that region, then I would lose comm, okay? And during the absorptive period, I would lose it. It'd be gone. <coughs> Um, so, but there is a maximum distance it spreads out to. Once you exceed that, it's getting so thin, it begins to work like an ionosphere again. Meaning, what was the phrase? An F layer formed at a higher altitude? That's what happens. It's actually forming higher than I've drawn it. I've drawn it at the same level. But um, it's actually forming up there. But, but it forms, all right? So, but, so you still have low angle sky wave, works great all the time. Invis becomes different, and I'm going to talk about the differentness. Here's your periods. Absorption period, a transient period, and stable. Um, what the film strips look like is kind of like this. Clutter, noise, and a faint band. This would be like um, 80 meters. You know, it refracts off, it comes down. 40 meters is up here. 15 meters is up here. Now, during this absorptive period, where the bomb goes off here, nothing comes back. It actually looks white. I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, during this transient, per transient period, what you have is you have frequencies that work that appear for a while and then fade away and, and disappear. And they come and they go and they stuff. But, so there's opportunity, but it's sporadic. It's kind of like working sporadic E, but faster. And then after a while of that, then things become stable, but they are, they are slowly changing, right? So that's what the nuke actually looks like. That's what really happens. So the idea is if, if you want to talk literally underneath or through a nuclear debris cloud, what you have to do is have a protocol, an automatic link establishment thing, that just very quickly listens and tries to figure out where am I trying? You know, sounding, beep, 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 try different frequencies and have a multi-channel software-defined radio listening and I transmit a sequence of pulses up and then I'll listen for all the replies and if I hear one, I know you're there. So there, there's a way to do this and I presented this at Offutt Air Force Base and the Air Force was really, really excited about it. So kind of, oh, we really can do it. You know, so the enemies cannot de deny us calm during this time because you do this polling thing and you'll bounce off something and it'll work. And it'll work for a period of time. So, um, I summarized it for the, for the Dayton thing this way. Broken links, fading links, noisy links, right? And the radio's seeking desperately to find out where it is. It's kind of like a normal field day. That's what we do, right? Lots of broken links, short communications, quick calm, um, emergency action messages. Average 33 bytes. That's it. 33 bytes. Okay. Any questions before I go off that topic? So how would CME fit into that? that Coronal mass ejection is no different than a nuke. It really isn't. It's a big yeah, mass of charged yeah, plasma. Like no, it's big. It gen well, generally, it's big. I mean, bigger than the Earth's diameter. Um, so but if you get hit square on, you might get hit. You, you might, yeah, you might, yeah. But there's no difference. Um, the, the charged particles come in, and the atmosphere is, are just atoms of gases. And what the nuclear event does 
is it has neutrons that rip the electrons off of an atom and it becomes charged. Once it's charged, it'll refract radio waves. Now, if you have too much refraction, it, too much um, um, ionis ionization, it'll become absorptive based on the frequency. So, you know, it's a, it's a complicated thing as far as frequency and intensity, but um, it just, it's just like the sunshine, which is why this, this um, eclipse is, is so important because, honest to goodness, it's actually the military is tracking it really close. <laughs> they really want to know this because it's, think about what happens. Suddenly the sun goes away and this region, this very abrupt edge, much more abrupt than the sun setting or coming up, um, you have this region that goes dark and that is not scintillated anymore. And that's good, they, they collect that data, but what they're really looking for is the transition from non-scintillated to the sun suddenly, si sun suddenly shines down again and starts scintillating the ionosphere. What, what does that edge look like? Because that looks like a nuke, all right? So that edge will tell you something. It'll tell everybody something, you know? Now, I imagine the Chinese have people sitting in Arizona waiting for this to happen, or Colorado. Other questions? So, yeah, Bill. So when the, if you're the poor guy that's right under the nuke and you're communicating, mm -hmm. if it, when that goes off, does your equipment still work? There's two, two, two things here, right? Well, there's three, but um, the toughest one is electromagnetic pulse, right. and you can solve that with a 93 cent transorb from DigiKey, all right? And Larry's, Larry's your guru man. He knows everything. He taught me everything I know. Um, but, you, but think about this. You, you're suddenly in a field from 30 to 50,000 volts per meter. Here's a meter, right? So your wristwatch is going to have 1,000 volts across it. It's going to be gone, right? Uh, things that have wires on them are going to collect that and run in. I did nuclear EMP hardening down when I worked at Boeing 40 years ago. And we had, we had 50,000 volts per meter. And the inrush on a wire was about 1,500 volts at 1,200 amps. And it was not a hard problem to solve. Transorbs do that because it lasts a very narrow amount of time that I won't mention, but you can read it on the internet. Um, and uh, so you need to protect your power lines. My, my radios have a 1,500 watt, watt, but only for a very short amount of time, not much energy just a lot of current, right across the 12 volt connector where it enters the box with a capacitor. And then at the other end, you know, so I have a, lo a lot of this done. Microphone cables have the same thing because they pick up things. Your box itself is, your box itself is probably safe because there is no EMP at 100 megahertz. So what's a waveguide beyond cutoff at 100 megahertz? It's about four inches, three inches. So your radio is probably not going to allow EMP to come in as a force field, right? It's the wires coming in that's going to blow you up. And it's not hard to protect them. It's just not. Um, it's a case of aperture. No it's aperture. aperture. Your aperture is, mm -hmm. EMP is pretty much after 60 megahertz. It's, it's not the damage. Yeah. Very, so your two meter rig? Yeah. Right. It's well, HF. If they don't put those uh, that protection on the 12 volt line when you buy the radio. No, they don't. Flex happens to have a transorb on their front end. I had a direct lightning strike and it blew my front end apart. And that's when I uh, <clears throat> kind of had a come to Jesus moment on EMP things. So <laughs> um, I also had a, I had a 17 foot um, MFJ 2 meter 440 rig. And we have one top of our yes, the big tall thing. Lightning came down that fiberglass ray dome to get to my ground tower, which is, I have a very good ground on the, on the thing, and Svetnov guided me on that. Um, it came down and it completely dissolved, burned up and oxidized and disappeared the entire antenna, melted one of the elements, and you had all these arcing and sparking on the top where the vertical was, and pew, straight down, but everything that was protected was not damaged. And that was a direct strike, a direct strike. So, yeah, you, you, you can save your stuff. A nuke would not be that bad. There's a lot more energy in this. Anything else? So, so you talked about debris field mm -hmm. issues. Is there no residual effect from pulse, the magnetic pulse in the first place? Oh, no, no, there's nothing residual, uh-uh. No, the, the, the electromagnetic, yeah, the, the electromagnetic pulse 
um, is, is very short, um, very intense, and then it's gone, really. Um, the radiation is, um, is, is way out. I mean, the B-52 has radiation hardening, which is a different, totally different field and problem than EMP. Um, but if you're going to stand off and, 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 and send a, a cruise missile, radiation, you're not going to be where the radiation is going to bother people. And um, when I worked nukes, I had to do radiation back then. And we were designing with Z80s, digital parts. The RF parts were not, not susceptible. The only part we had to check was an NMOS processor, the Z80. We had to do lot testing. And if anyone, we radiated them, Sandia's labs. And they radiated samples from a lot. If anything failed, we had to throw the whole lot away and buy a new lot, try it and sort them out. So that was total dose gamma dot type radiation things. The real problem is EMP. Real problem is EMP. One of the big interests that the Air Force has is when the bombers, the bombers are, have got EMP protection, but it takes two tankers to go out and two tankers to come back for every bomber. So there's four tankers for every bomber, right? You know, and the deterrent is don't mess with the U.S. because we can, we can retaliate with these planes. The problem is, and this is public, is that the brand new planes, the KC-10s and the C-46, right? C-46? KC-46? Yeah. They're fly-by-wire. They're not EMP protected. And when a nuke goes off over the Pacific, they will splash. The bombers won't make it. There's been, ah. There's been some work done on that, but it's, it's mostly from the lightning side. It is, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not the NAV stuff, no. So I was down at Fort Scott Air Force Base, and I was briefing them, walking them carefully through this thing, and I said, but your KC-135s are mechanical. If you got the strength, you can fly a KC-135 with cables. Pilot and co-pilot push on it and you know, turn the yoke, and they can fly it. The whole cockpit will go black, and here's why they were interested in Rockwell. We have an ARC-190 on that plane. It's obsolete, it's old, it's there, it fills the hole, and it's HF comm, right? When the nuke occurs, all right, if they had an EMP-proofed ARC-190 on there, meaning if they came and bought a new ARC-190 and helped fund it, they could still be operating. Now, with a real modem, I can tell you with HF ranging within about 50 miles where you are. And plus, you know, I mean, I, you, you could have an EMP-proof cable and an EMP-proof tough, tough book, a dongle or a tablet or some type of thing that you could bring up, lay on the pilot's lap in front of his whole cockpit that's totally dead, black, say, okay, George, here's where we are. And, and, and the, the guys down there at Fort Scott, at Scott Air Force Base, really lit up because they said, if you can give us 50 miles, it gave me goosebumps at the time, you give me 50 miles, we can do our mission. So just solving the EMP problem keeps the 135s in the air. So I briefed this at, uh, at Stratcom at Offutt, and they were really excited about that. I mean, let, let, let's get that, because we can't do anything to the 135s. They're so old.